Hello everybody and welcome back to the Two Norries podcast. As always, I am joined by my good friend Timmy Long. Hi everyone. I am your host, James Leonard, and my cousin Rowan is on the decks. And this week we have another Nori, um, a local musician um, and a local character, uh, Miles Gaffney. How's it going, lads? How's the farm, Miles? Great, lads. And look, just before we start... I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here and the two of you should be very proud of, of what you're what you're after achieving in your life uh, for your families and, and and just for the north side in general. You've inspired a lot of fellas that I know. And look, I just brought these two gifts here for you, okay? Whose one is this? This is Timmy's one. <laughs> and that's James, that's for you, boy. Thanks, so boy. basically, lads, they're, um, <laughs> they were made by a company called Lyrpix. Um and yeah, they right. asked me to present them to you this evening. And they do, they do um, songs, print any song you want and, and frame it for you for a very small fee, very it's reasonable. very cool, isn't it? So, lads, look, I hand wrote them my selfie and I put in personalised verse 5 and verse 6 for yourselves. So, the two Norries are after We're getting their own verse. Immortalised. You're immortalised forever, lads. I was, think, I was thinking on the way down... Um, a song, you know, the ballad of Timmy now. Huh? I'll tell you a story, what happened to me. <laughs> Jesus Maybe Christ. Christy Moore might give us a bash with that or uh, give us a hand with you the could, lyrics you, to that. You couldn't fit that into the song, that'd be an opera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, I know, but oh, that's beautiful. Geez. Thanks a million, no, mate. As I say, it was supplied by Lear Picks. Um, yeah. Check them out. And um, look, I wanted it to be kind of a bit authentic. So like, yeah. instead, rather than printing the lyric, I, I wrote it and he yeah. scanned them then for you. So. It's perfect. Thanks, Miles. And you give us a blast off in a minute. Yeah. Why will, of course. That's the job. That's the job you brought. You'll get the hell on. I did. Mm. Do you know what? You're, the, the, you're about the fourth or fifth musician we'd had on yeah. already. We'd had Victoria Keating, um, Anla as a musician yeah. that was here last week. Was uh, the Druids, Mick, Mick O'Brien. Mick O'Brien. Yeah. Who else? Uh, Rebecca. No, that was Victoria. Yeah, the girl that plays Declan Sinnott. Yeah, that was Victoria, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but we have had a good few, so we might get an old, uh, an Ari, um, yeah. an Ari band going on in the days. We had the poet, we had um, Owen, Owen oh, his, yeah. his poem, right, which is yeah. beautiful, as well as about gambling addiction. Yeah, so we've had oh, Owen Coyne. Yeah, that's I right. He was, yeah, 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 very like, interesting yeah. guy, actually. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. yeah. I, I listened to it, yeah. I'd say there's a song. like, he was all right, like. There's definitely a song there, Miles. There's a song yeah. sure you've done, yeah. to be honest, like, but, you know? uh, A lot of people will know you, but a lot of people who watch the podcast might not know you. For those who don't know you, who are you and where are you from? Well, my name is Miles Gaffney and um, I was born reared on Redemption Road on the north side of Cork City. It's something I'm very proud of because Redemption Road is, and St Mary's Road is like the real north side, really, before the rest of it was built. Mm. Um so it's, it's for people that's from Cork but might not be familiar with the north side, you're just above Thomas Davis Street off Blackpool. Yeah, Neptune Stadium. Yeah, Neptune Stadium. That's where that's where it's built. It's next left to the and man. right. Yeah. yeah, my grandmother's house is next to the man. Yeah, you know, right next to the school. Um, I'm very proud of where I come from. Um, both my parents, our neighbours. They, my dad was from the start of them road, and my mother was straight across the road. So my two grandmothers. The O'Neills and the Gaffneys who could see each other's house. Um, I had a great childhood, really, to be honest, growing up in that area. Um, we had one kind of, I suppose, my mother died when I was young. She died when I was 10. But, you know, like, um, outside of that kind of setback in my life and my sisters um, at the time, um, we had a great life. My dad was is a great man, Um we never wanted for anything. We had a great rearing. And I always kind of tried to base my my actions and the way I live on my, on my father because he's my, my yeah. role model, you know. Um, lovely. I do, yeah. I always, I always tried to copy, well, not copy him and be him, but what he taught me, I tried to carry out in my own life. Um, so years later, then my, my father remarried a woman called Sarah and they had more children. And unfortunately, they, they buried a... A sister of mine then as well, uh, Grace, God rest her. Um, she had plenty of tragedy in the family. So we, we had, we had, but I suppose f- from from a young age, myself, um, and everyone he kind of copped this on. I said this two or three weeks ago when I met you in the shop. I, I've been search, searching, you know, there's something missing in my life, all my life, and I finally nailed it. 
Um, couple, maybe about a year ago, it's actually, I'm lacking the mother's love mm. all my life. Mm. And um, I was in a few relationships I'm married now, but kind of thinking back, maybe the relationships in my eyes weren't working is because I was looking for that love from another female that I was in a relationship or, you know, mm. and so that's why I was saying that she wouldn't be for me and all that, because I was searching for something that nobody else could give me. Mm. And I'm actually satisfied now in my life that that is what I'm, I'm missing. And mm. my dad always said to me, like, would you not go out, see a counsellor and have a chat? And I was saying that, so I have an control to it. But looking back now, I probably will take him up on the offer when this is over and um, just, just, just get to the bottom of this once and for all. Yeah. But your mother was Kay. Kay, yeah. She was a friend of my auntie, Claire. So mm. we in school. She was a beautiful looking lady. She was, God love she, yeah. she was meant to be lovely by all accounts. Mm. Have you all got fond memories of her? Or is, is it a haze at uh, the stage? Or? No, I, I, I don't. I, but, you know, it's amazing how things stick with you in your life. Um, I can tell you here this evening where I was <clears throat> and who I was with and who brought me to see my mother before she died. It was only kind of that night it, it dawned on me what was happening. Mm. I was only 10. Mm. I was down in, in my auntie Fina's house down in Rickson's Lane, but all our family came from there anyway, and they all lived there. Where's Rickson's Lane? Rickson's Lane, so you know, um, St Mary's Road, where St Vincent's School is, and there's yeah. a small corner shop there. Yeah. If you go down the steps, the side of the shop, yeah. that's Bunker's Hill, oh, okay, right? Yeah. But when you go left, there's a little lane. With brings the you down. Way. Yeah. That's Rickson's lane. Oh, I see, yeah. And Must be down there on the hop from the man's smoking house. That's, where he's, called, <laughs> that's <laughs> where he's called Bunkers Hill. <laughs> but but um, I, I remember I, I was the film on the telly, was the bodyguard, was the film. Uh, my aunt's husband, Barry Murphy, he was minding me. Um, and I remember Barry, like, I'd always. Over your eyes, here's the wobbly bits, and you'd be sitting all like that, but you'd have your finger up and trying to see a bit. Like, yeah. and uh, there was a knock on the door, and the man at the door was a man named Donald Galvin. And he, the two of them went outside the door, and I, I to this day, I remember it like saying, nah, There's something, there's something not right here. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, Galley putting his hand in and saying, Come on with me. I remember he brought me, brought, put me into his car and we went down by St. Vincent's and just to make me laugh, he drove through between the wall and, and the light post to make me laugh, you know? Yeah. And uh, on the footpath, like, and uh, we went up to the house anyway, and I, I remember it. And that, I remember my brother in there, I remember who was there. And that's where I got that song years later, Come Hold My Hanson, because I remember that's what she said to me, Come over here and hold my Hanson. Mm. And, like, I was there for maybe half an hour or something, and should the next day I didn't, and I woke up, she was gone, like... Yeah. Uh, was it cancer? Yeah, yeah, God love her, yeah. Probably if it was there today, there'd be no problem. But mm-hmm. sure, like, they didn't have what they have today, and she would have lived, but... Yeah. It was after spreading to vital organs, and yeah. a young woman, 33, like... <coughs> there was That's me, younger than what I am, no? It was my two yeah. sisters, Kate and Carol Ann, um, were, were very young. And, um, you know, I remember then... Um, Afterwards, I was kind of pretending going to school and stuff. That me aunt was me mam just to be don't know, I was like the boys be talking about their mam and I'd be saying that's my mam as well. Like mm. I was pretending me aunt just represent me in school, like you know. And uh, I was be, but then then t- 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 it was about twelve one day. I remember it like I just said to myself, you know. St- I was be crying in my room or whatever, and, and, I, and I said, um, you know, d- d- this is what certain set out for me in life, and that I have to um, accept it. Mm. And after that. I didn't bother with it no more. Put it in the back of my head and said, drive on. Mm. Don't dwell on this. And to this day, from from doing that back then, Grace would always say to me, like, Miles, a bit of compassion, boy. But I said, Grace, like, they're gone. You know, yeah. that's life. That people have died and mm. we can't, I, I wouldn't dwell on it. I'd say they live their life now and God called them. Mm. And went, it'll happen to me someday and that's it. You know, see people dwelling on death and mm. they can't get over it. Well, I'd have no problem in getting over or something like that, like, because I've done it before. Yeah. And mm. I've no problem in facing death. It's, it's you know another I mean? part of life, really, like, isn't it? Yeah. Like, by all accounts, your, your mother, she brought the kids into the world. 
and um, she had a big impact on people, you know, so mm -hmm. might have been here for a short time, but used it well. And, you know, I, I, I have a conversation with my wife as well. She, I hope she don't mind me saying it, but she's always very anxious mm -hmm. about death, you know. Yeah. And I don't worry about it because you've no control over it and just use your time while you're here. And if it comes, it comes. That's, that's, it's part of it. You, you can't control that. Mm -hmm. And if you can't control something, you can't give it energy, you know. So it's just, it's just an unfortunate thing when it happens so young. You know, you've so much life left. But you know, she'd be very proud of you today anyway. You know, and your father did a great job because it would be very easy there a few miles in your coming into your teenage years when people experiment with alcohol and drugs. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if you did or not, but, um, it, like maybe all the characteristics were there for somebody to run with alcoholism there, do you know what I mean? And, and yeah. start drowning out all that, that trauma and that sadness and that hurt and that pain. Um, but you didn't, so fair play to your father, he give, he helped yeah. you out with the coping skills to get through that. He and, did, and, and your mother. Because they said, uh, show me the eight-year-old or the seven-year-old, eight-year-old or whatever, and I show you the man. Yeah. You know, all your programs, all your habits and stuff, they're all gained at that age like yeah. you know and, and you can see where you are with your nature and I've met you a, a good few times like your parents have done a great job with you like yeah thanks you know? very much Timmy like yeah. even I would be blown away I got very emotional when I see the the, yeah. the, the frames like when I, and listening to your mother's story because you know I lost my mother to, to mental health yeah. issues as well suicide and you know I, I was looking at your face and, and I could see that there is there still is a bit of healing around it. There is. That's what I need to get yeah. to the bottom of now. And this was in the back of my mind too. There was always, geez, you're on about now, like the drugs and drinking and stuff, like these and, and, and the five pound deal and the 10 pound deal yeah. was all the, all the my, in my time. But there was always in the back of my mind about, geez, my man be watching me doing this now, I'd be leaving her dumb. She'd be sad. No, she saw me now. Because I'm very religious. Yeah. And I was brought up that way. And uh, so I always, like, said, so me and my mum's above in heaven here and I'm watching me here and tonight, like, fucking ways by, don't do it, even though I don't. Yeah. But the real reason why I never went down that road is because for me, very young boy, 13, I used to frequent the Sinn Féin office in Barrack Street. Um, I kind of started, I took a deep interest in Irish history and stuff when I was about 10 or 11. Uh, very wrong. My uncle Liam would have bred me into the, the songs, the yeah. Wolf Tones now, and Christy Moore. And I remember, like, he used to have an old fiesta. And do you know the, do you know the drive up Fitzgerald's Park where you mm. go up by the bridge and it, it opens up? Yeah. He'd have all of us in the car, like, all, all the nephews, like, and he'd be, he'd be going up the big, the big gear stick. Mm. And I, he'd have torn up this doom varna, up blasting. Yeah. And I, he'd be saying, go on, Wiley. And I'd be saying, oh, this doom varna. But I was only about three or four. Yeah. And then he'd say, well, go up on two wheels. And then, Arr! and all of us be in the back like that, up against <laughs> each other. But he, he bred all them songs into me. And it was kind of like, when, when I got to the age then of looking into history, it was like, sure, that's what that song's about. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what that, so I started piecing it together. Yeah. And anyway, going forward, when I went into secondary school then, I met two guys who, who, were, uh, who had deep connections with the Irish Republican Socialist Party. Um, and they were, they were well advanced mm. where, from where I was coming from. Um, so they taught me that there was a Sinn Féin office. So I started going over there, told no one, no, I just slipped down the industry, straight through and up there. I was buy a book now, or I'd get an old CD, and that's how it kind of started out. And then... I started going there every Wednesday, just buying a few bits and pieces, educating myself. And then I kind of struck up a friendship with Mick Nugent. Oh, yeah, and Mick, um, yeah. so then I was kind of left wandering there. I was left in the back and I might get an old job. You know, they'd say, do you want to do them there? I'd be getting the leaflets together or the young publix to be sold at the weekend, yeah. all little things like that. And um, so... At the time, the Sinn Féin were massive anti-drugs. They had big posters up and they were they were very active yeah. in that area. And um, I suppose I got to know a couple of high-ranking high Republicans then. And um, f I think I think it's it's from being around them that I, I didn't bother yeah. because I was afraid that they, they'd say, get out of here, you. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were smoking giants the other night. Mm -hmm. We heard about it. And I didn't bother with it. I I never bothered with with yeah. that. And all the boys now would be taking yokes and yeah. 
Do you know, I remember a fella there, one he was down the farmer's field, like, and he, he, his runners were melted on his feet, and everyone was out of it except me, and I remember standing there. I remember your brother was there the same night now as well, and I remember standing there saying, is there anybody going to do anything for this fella here? And Tommy's always there, boy. <laughs> and we, we, we know, we know, we know the guy that was in the fire ourselves, like, and I remember going on pulling him out, like, in the club, and, and the runners were melting on his feet, like, because everyone was just out of it, and I was saying that. This is not for me at all. So I, I think I, there was a woman actually said to my aunt one time, she said, my son, she said, never brought any trouble to my door as much as she said, as I didn't like him going over there. She said, he never brought any trouble to my door once he was with them people mm. because it wasn't tolerated. There, mm. was, it was, there was a disciplined structure. You wouldn't even have to be disciplined. Yeah. You would just get that vibe that these people are disciplined. And you don't step out of the line. Yeah. And I think I followed that. Isn't it just goes to show it's all about the, the context and environment as well? Like, uh, at a similar age, we would have been in a very different uh, social context where drug use was very prevalent and accepted and maybe you would get frowned upon if you didn't use drugs, yeah. you know what I mean? Whereas you you were in a situation that was complete opposite. Do you know what yeah. so, I think I think I think it done me the world of good... Um, you know, as I said, I, I, was, I was quiet for years, and then I, I was seeing someone anyway, from whatever, and the old man got wind of it at the time, and he, of course he was worried. I didn't know it was I after a giant, and oh, yeah. I'd been trained, but there was none of that. Like, yeah. I mean, I completely denounced violence. Yeah. Um, what, what actually drew me to it, I had a poster in, in, in my bedroom then, and I said, She Guevara, freedom can be won without a struggle. Mm. And I, I read into that then. And that's why I would still vote for Sinn Féin today, is because I believe in their peace strategy. And yeah. uh, I think it's great for Ireland, and long may it continue. Mm. But as in violence, I wouldn't, I wouldn't favour it at all. And that's the truth, because I wouldn't have a violent bone in my body. And, you know, you know I, liked, I liked the evolution of Sinn Féin from those early days that you were involved, where it was drug users were almost frowned upon or stigmatised. But I think Sinn Féin have come a long way since then. And I think there's more of an understanding that these drug users and people in addiction, the homeless people, they're not other people. They're your, they're, they're people in your community, and they're your, your, your children, sons and daughters. And I think Sinn Féin has um, been very progressive around um, how they speak around homelessness, drugs, housing, stuff like that. Um, I think the old adage of a republic, if you were a republican, you know, you wouldn't dare to you know, associate yourself with somebody that used drugs or that have been in prison. But I think now Sinn Féin realises that um, it's just the criminalisation of poverty. Do you know what I mean? That's what it is. That's what a prison environment is. If you went to prison, Miles, doing a gig, which I hope you do someday, you'll see that in prisons is poor people. It's all poor people. 99% is poor people. And we shouldn't stigmatise and other those people because they're the people from our communities. Yeah. And I think Sinn Féin have that now. They have. You know? and I, I, I do not with Jonathan O'Brien, who's finished mm -hmm. up in Thomas School, that's there now. Um, but a lot of those, a lot of those uh, people in Sinn Féin or Thomas School and whatever are the TDs around the place, a lot of them would have families like that are in prison, that yeah, yeah, are on the streets from class. drug addiction and, and things like that. It's, yeah. it's, I remember Timmy, a high-ranking Republican at the time, his name was Mitchell McLaughlin. It was the first time that I ever attended a, such a, a gathering and I went along kind of so I suss this out and see what the story is. And like he spoke that night of what actually is happening right now today. Like he, I remember like he, him tell, addressing the audience, telling them like that this is where we're going. Like, and anybody who thinks that like this, this campaign of violence is, is, it's not. This is the road we've set out. It's a peace road. And he spoke about decommissioning and, and, and the Good Friday Agreement and all that. At back then, this is late nineties, mm. 2000. So they actually followed through. And a lot of the guys know that I would have known back then. Like some of them went their own way. Some of them didn't bother anymore. You know, some of them went to different groups and I, I know all them boys too and I say hello to them and there's no bother. Um, they respect me and I respect them, but what you're saying there is like that they, they definitely changed for the people, for the working class areas Yeah. to include everybody. Exactly. You know? I think I think they definitely did. And you know, when I hear 
McNugent and you know we've got great representation for Sinn Féin on our side like do, yeah. you know because why because they speak on our behalf and when I when I'm listening to the, the politics and stuff like that I feel represented when I hear Sinn Féin speaking and it could be you know Owen O'Brien or it could be um, Pierre Starty or Mary Lou MacDonald when I hear them speaking I feel like you know what they're speaking my language and I don't, I don't get that connection with the other parties, you know. So I, I do feel like that um, Sinn Féin is a good time, and I vote for Sinn Féin too. I'm a member as well, oh, yeah. although I'm not active because yeah. I was a mem- I became a member, and then we started the podcast, and I tried to be apolitical because you know it's the yeah. what the issues mean to me. Talk about on the podcast, they can't be partisan. Do you know what I mean? They have to have cross party support. You know, it, it can't be like um, we it, can't have people falling out with the, the yeah. podcast because of uh, their side and the poli- it's the same on a political music, level. And that's why I'm not a member of because the Because we, yeah. the, those people could possibly, at the end, be somebody that's really struggling and then all of a sudden they might be belong to one party or believe in one party and uh, we might be talking about a different party here yeah. and they could leave and, and the yeah. chance of whatever help they could get from listening to this yeah. or listening to something else down the line. Uh, is gone, but listen, we all we all have our own beliefs. We've exactly. all you know, like you have a belief, I have a belief, and and, and they're very similar. Yeah. And saying that, no, like as much as I like Sinn Fein today, if fucking boy, if the world turned upside down and all of a sudden Fine Gael or exposing progressive politics around housing and drug policy and decriminalisation stuff like that, I'd give them kudos if it was due. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Or I'd support. Uh, the Labour Party, if I felt that they had the better policies, so I'm not about the party, I'm about the policies. Yeah. And at the moment, I think Sinn Féin have the best policies from pe- for people like me. Mm-hmm. So that's why I would vote Sinn Féin. But mm-hmm. if that changed in the morning, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be blind fair either. Although, like, obviously from a Republican family myself, you know, I would be connection with uh, Sinn Féin and that as well. But um, that's enough for Sinn Féin. That's enough, yeah. <laughs> we get turned off by the. <laughs> 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 yeah, but anyway, so the, the, but long story short, anyway, you were involved with Sinn Féin as a teenager, and that yeah. kept you on the straight and narrow. Definitely, yeah. And um, then I suppose I, I, my music started then from fellas I, 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 I met down through the years. Um, I was playing music as a young flat. I actually thought I was in Queen. Uh, I used to have uh, two dishes, two pots, and two wooden spoons and it, my old man had um, Queen Live in Wembley on a cassette and uh, I'd be sitting down then playing away in the front room jeez I was only about five or six like yeah. banging making noise so then when I was about ten uh, eleven after my mother died um, the Manning Brothers band you know they were, they were neighbours of ours their Jerry Manning was our neighbour he was playing around with his son Kieran Kieran had a practice drum kit in his house they, they could fold these up like that like you know Mm-hmm. So I couldn't wait to get up to kill ants and we we'll rattle off the drums that were real. And then uh, me, I got started getting drum music lessons then of Sean Ford out in Talker. Uh, my old man bought me um, a Pearl Export drum kit. At the time, no, they were like the Mercedes of drum kits, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I had one anyway. And I went all the way up to level three then in, in Trinity College in London in, in read music. I kind of got fed up with that then, so when I was about 13 then, I got the guitar. Uh, I got taught three chords by Trevor St. Ledger, and uh, I kind of took a, took, taught myself after that. I started writing songs then when I was about 13 or 14. Uh, I actually found them, believe it or not, my nan's attic in a bag last year. It was brilliant to look back on them. Yeah, like, I can imagine. Uh, very childish lyrics now and yeah. all this kind of thing. But... Um, and that was grand. I, I, no, when he knew then that I, that I was doing that, like, that I, I was able to do this um, for years and years and years. Like, it was you the kept it yourself. That I could play all these instruments. I could play loads of instruments. It was like, pick it up and play it. Yeah. Uh, I remember Pa the Piper one day gave me his bagpipes and he was slagging me. Bet you wouldn't be able to do that, eh? You know, Pa. And uh, we're up in the cold with me, I feel. And I uh, said, give me them. I was bellowing away and it was not happening. And he's laughing. I said, here, take him back. And Pat was playing the nation once again. And the wife, I see his thumb doing that. So he gave it back to me then. I said, ha, ah, yeah. Valve. I got a sound out of him anyway, like, you know. But I just had that ability to, to pick him yeah. up and play him. Do you know, the, the pipes especially, I think, do you know, when I hear, and 
No, when I pulled in here a while ago, the, the music blast, and it was a uh, planks the uh, she vyog she It's yeah. a it's a jig, yeah. And Liam O'Flynn plays the, the Ilham pipes. pipes, but they're unbelievable sound. And when yeah. I know when I hear that sound, it makes me feel Irish. Like yeah. I know I'm Irish when I hear that type of music because the hair stand up in the back of my neck. Mm-hmm. So, Pro gems, yeah, it is. Like, yeah. I actually have them on all my new music, like, and the lads here at Ilham Pipes because because they take so long to tune into. You have to go note by note because they're they're craving off tuning every day. But anyway, we're gonna we're gonna have, yeah. have no tunings. But so there was a, a band in Cork called the All Volunteer Pipe Band, and based in Yall, obviously. And um, what started to happen over the years was is a lot of members of the city now were in the all band more than the all people and it was decided that I was asked would I would I be interested in getting involved in starting a pipe band in Cork. So again, back to the, the Sinn Féin Hall. There was a meeting in the Sinn Féin Hall anyway and um, there was three or four of us there and it was decided on the night that this band would be called the McCurt and McSweeney band. And... Um, I, I was basically given the job to build it and, and I did and I did and we had a fantastic band so that then was my first time getting confidence to play an instrument in public mm. I could play the drums I could play the, 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 f- the fife it was no problem um, and it was through that then uh, Don Bullman he, you know, yeah, that, know, he that, the yeah. services Don rang me one day and he said I'd start up a band he said he said I'd love for you to come in on the flute and I said, Dan, no, I taught him nothing about the other instruments, or that I, I could sing it, or blast the tune. And we went up to Dan's, and anyway, he had the rest of the band in the room. He said, This is my little cellar, lads, I'm bringing him in on the flute. I was an awful wreck. He said, No, you know, Dan, I'm singing where they are. Go on. <laughs> and I was like, Here. Yeah. And he was like, Yeah, go on, go on. Lads, play that there for him there. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, he's on the corner. I was like, ah. Sing it up, come on, come on, come on, sing it up. Anyway, that was fine. It was a gig then Saturday night. He gave me the list of songs to learn and, and the keys, what, what, what key they were to be in. And uh, my first ever live gig that paid me to play it was in a hotel down in Ballybunion. And uh, I remember it was about four songs into the gig and it, it was my turn then to sing. And I remember he was looking over at me going... And he was, was saying, he thinks this is so normal. Like, and I was shaking, like... I went up anyway, I was back home in Derry or something. I sang it anyway and I never looked back since. And, um, you know, Don, Don was very good to me. And, you know, like I left all the, uh, you know, ignoring fellas knowing all that. I put all that behind me years ago. Mm-hmm. I don't carry no grudges. Yeah. I used to be wanting past fellas in your 20s that scored a goal against New Fam when we were 14. Do you know? <laughs> I don't talk to him a lot. Like yeah. all this stupid, silly <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And, of course, I had left the band and... Fellas were telling me all these little stories and I was getting married at the time and something. I, I always regret it, like. Uh, and Don knows this, like, didn't, I, I believe that Don had said something about me and he didn't. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I never invited him and it, to my wedding and Amanda was very good to me and still is. Always good to drop a birthday card up to the kids and things like mm-hmm. that. But he understood, like, look, it was my fault. I put my hand up. But I, I, that's one regret I have that I didn't give the man mm-hmm. an invitation because he's still to this day very good to me, like. And um, he watches the podcast. Yeah, does he? All right, Dan. He does, uh, <laughs> I walked with Dan over to Simon. Yeah, that's where he is. Yeah. And um, his wife, Marla, and his sons are very, very good to me. And um, that was the start of it. So I, I wanted to write songs. I approached the band about it. I said, lads, uh, you know, I said, um, this, some of the lads wanted to play heavy, heavy rebel songs. Like uh, Spirit of Freedom, heavier, type stuff. Heavier, heavier. Uh, really? Modern day stuff and... <laughs> Uh, that that was fine and then Dan didn't want to play kind of any of it at all I was okay with the kind of wolf tones and that yeah. because people don't know like what you're singing about you get away with Gary O and O and them old ones and the yeah. crowd be hopping but if you sang a modern day when the crowd are looking saying mm. what's going on here mm. so like my heart was, was, was in my country with my people. Like, I love my people, my country, my flag. I mean, it's not a crime to, to mm-hmm. love your culture. Um, I felt then that our culture was under threat and somebody needed to, to come up here with new, new songs. So basically, in the long run, there was all kind of in there going, I'm not singing that and he's singing that. And one day, and, you know, it was just a bit of an energy bargy happened and I said nothing and I just unplugged my equipment and took off. 
Dad rang me afterwards. Where are you? I said, I said, I'm over, but I said, ah, just no, no, no. I said, no, it's, I'm doing yeah. this. And, Did uh, you do you feel more comfortable singing about? We spoke with Anna or Caroline a few weeks ago. You might have heard the podcast. It was excellent. But we spoke about um, being able to celebrate. Um, being able to celebrate uh, incidents in the Republic from historical violence where we would be fighting for freedom, like Kill Michael and yeah. another. Uh, but the lads in the North not being able to, like, yeah. if, if they celebrate, frowned upon. So I suppose the question I might ask you is uh, were you or people, do you know, more comfortable singing about historical victories like, do you know, the boys of Kill Michael and would the, the the more um, modern or recent conflict songs would they be seen as more radical or yes so like I remember I give you an example I remember going to a place in Donnerill one night I went in first I sussed the crowd out age what we were looking at so coming back out to the lads I said lads this is the age group we have we'll stick to the pogs and yeah. you know furies and right we went in anyway we started off at you know, the Irish Rover or something anyway. Yes, they're all up. All Safe up. bet. <laughs> all flying. The next thing, it's going to, um, song anyway, it was heavy, it was a heavy, heavy Republican ballad and, and I said, don't, I said, don't, like, mm. it was a very long song as well, about seven minutes long and I said, if you sing that, I said, we're going to lose this, like, and by the time he opened his eyes when he was finished that song, I tell him you know, the bar was almost empty mm. mm-hmm. and I said, I told you, I don't care how I'm singing it. That, that's fine. That was that was that was all grand. But you have to gauge the crowd, it, like there were co- of course, like you know, um, I I I had a fellow one day, like like standing in front of me with the chest up, like <laughs> you know, as if to say, like I hear ballads, yeah. I hear that he was saying to me, and I was like, man, the man asked me to sing it, but calm down, standing with his point like in front of me, like the chest up, like. Uh-huh. As if to say, go on, you know. Okay, uh-huh. Do you know? And then I had another guy come up to me after and say, What he said, two devil go. <laughs> Do you know? And if I had told him, there would have been punches to him. <laughs> fucking but, um, the pub. I, I went on the songwriting road then and um, I never looked back since. Um, and your songs are about, uh, a lot of them are around social issues, aren't they? Yeah, um, again, you know, Irish history um, uh, or events mm. or people. And our, our social issues and things that are faced by um, modern day working class Ireland. Yeah. Um, I've what songs for every every aspect. And I kind of formed this thing now, uh, where like every album will have something about sport, will have something about drugs, will have something about the conflict in Ireland. It'll have something about, you know, a historical event, a football match, whatever it may yeah. be. But um. I, I, I really enjoy in the writing. I, I found a technique. I was taught it in school, believe it or not, up in the North Man. Um, I enjoyed going to school because I love school. The only thing I refused to do in school was French. And I got into an awful lot of trouble for it because I said to them, so I don't want to talk French at all. Mm-hmm. I'd rather do an extra class of Irish yeah. because that's my native language. Why, why, why am I learning French? Right? I'm moving to France. Yeah. And I... Um, I actually touched down, I contacted the teacher, a fellow called Michael Minahan. He taught me history, right? And I was in higher level history. So in higher level history, you, you, you're, you're leaving such, you, you could get any five topics. But you'd have a special topic then, which you pick yourself. At the time, I picked Roger Casement, right? And Banner Strand, mm-hmm. that was my... So you, you had that essay in the bag before you went in. Mm. And then you could have two from European history and two from Irish history. It could be anything. It could be Bismarck, the Reformation. It could be anything. Yeah. And then you could have any aspect of Ireland. And uh, a lot of the lads in school, you know, they'd be writing five pages of, of an essay. Like, so he'd done five pages. So he left to say that was good. But an awful lot of it was irrelevant information. Mm. Fellas repeating things they had said in a different wording in another paragraph. So Mr. Moynihan taught me this technique of where you took the title, right, of the song and, like, don't move then. That's the subject and don't move from that. Anything that's not related to this title is irrelevant. And then you'd write down, say, I don't know, say, Easter 1916, say, right, Easter 1916, right, next one, uh, rebellion, next word, what else happened, uh, 
the seven signatories, right? The, all their names and Kilmainham Jail and Collins Street, the GPO, all that. And you build your song around that then. Do you know? And that's the technique I use to write my songs today. Yeah. And I, I told him and all, and he was delighted. I told him on the phone. And yeah. he had a saying, you know, there's all in the rearing. And <laughs> I, I, when I was hanging up the phone, I said, Mr. Moynihan. Yeah, he said, tis all in the railing. And he, got a, he said, why is my rat to make yeah. me day? He said, yeah. he was laughing. Uh, That's a nice story, though. I went to the yeah. man as well. I think I was in the air below you, was I? You would have been, yeah. I, but I, I was, uh, you sounded like you were a well-rounded young fly. was kind of at me game in that school. I spent most of my time outside Murti Murakou's office. Murti, yeah. And I got into a lot of trouble. I loved history like yourself, especially Irish history. It was my strongest subject. And geography. And yeah. I dropped the two of them after my junior so because I didn't, I didn't like the teachers and I did two couple of foundations for me it was just a waste of time do you know what I mean yeah. I, I, I'd love to have you know if I, I'd have loved to have embraced it then do you know what I mean but I learned loads afterwards you know but it was just uh, very contrasting experiences of the same school at the same time yeah I, 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 the first song I ever recorded was on Vanish the Hoigaboo it was a tester it was a it was just to see was I able for it yeah. Raiga Raiga on Vanish the Hoigaboo Um I, I I recorded that. That was my first ever time going to record the studio. I I done that, um, and then after that, then I I, I started with Roy Keane then, and uh, actually Marty Murph. I wrote a song for Teddy McCarthy after reading his book mm. Teddy Boy, and uh, Marty is in the song. Marty and Donald Grady, because they oh, were Donald two, was the principal were, in the AG, wasn't yeah, he? and he was the cock manager, yeah, and, and yeah, he, right, he was yeah. the principal and. Dedicated hurling man, Marty yeah. was a fierce hurling man. Yeah, he was. And yeah. there, uh, Don Logrady and Marty Murphy, captain, and he won the Dr. Hartley Cup. Mm. The, that's the line of the song, yeah. you know? Can you yeah. remember Sean O'Connor coming up with uh, Liam McCarthy when yeah. you know, Yeah, after Roland, the L, yeah. Uh, happy days, boy. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm all going to A lot of your songs are, are about people like that. You've actually gone to live with people and all. Yeah, songs, yeah, people. yeah. It's um, like. You, I see you mentioning there in your um, podcasts about Christy Moore sending the email as well. Yeah. Um, uh, one time, uh, one of my songs ended up with Christy Moore and a couple of my songs actually, a chap, Pat Ryan, Pat Ryan Music Services. Uh, I, I befriended Pat's daughter, her wife, and now Keelan Kenny is the man who plays with me all the time and records with me all the time. Um, so... I befriended Sarah and then I got to know her dad and he said, look, give me the song now and I, I'll get it to be fair. Like, and I was like, really? Um, so a friendship built up and one evening then um, I was on um, Facebook and Pat posted uh, that a picture of a painting and that he was going to, to Glasgow with this painting. And I was trying to figure out the painting. It was um, a guy in, um, you know, a... Uh, College, nobody with the the the, 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 the yeah, and the, the hat. The, yeah. uh, but, but it was all fire, and there was a, a demon in the fireplace behind his mm. head. And I was saying, that fella looks like Paddy Hill from the Birmingham Six. And um, I had read up and looked into the Birmingham Six for years. You know, I knew all about it. So I text Pat and said, what, what's the story with the picture? He says, that's a painting. He said, and we're going over to the Miscarriage of Justice Organisation in Glasgow, myself and Christy Moore tomorrow, and we're going to give it to Paddy Hill. And I said, I knew that was Paddy Hill. So I said to him, do you know when you're over there, Paddy said, tell Paddy Hill, I said, I'll come over there. I said, and I'll write a song about Paddy Hill. And he says, no problem. And he takes me then from over there. That's clear, he said. Here's the phone number, ring that number. And I did, I followed it up. I went over, I hung around with Paddy for a while, got the song. And it's not because I wrote it or made it or produced it. Like, this is on the new album and it, it's a belt of a song. Mm. The music, the piper and all that mm. is it's real Irish. It's real. It gives the real, um, it gives the real feeling of what actually happened to this man. Because mm. he was there, like, I got it off the horse, the horse's mouth. Like, mm. um, do you know, I seen a documentary with that it was like a fly in the wall thing. Paddy Joe Hill was a part of it. It was around miscarriages of justice. Yeah. Um, but it was a very sad to see at, at 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 that time he was kind of living on his own. His mental yeah. health wasn't yeah. great. The best yeah. years of his life was gone. He was still very hurt and very bitter about it, and rightly so. But it was it's sad, wasn't it? it was yeah, like, I brought him to Cork. I I I was at it down in the Commons. Wasn't yeah, it? I brought him to Cork. Um, and uh, like he can talks. I tell you one quick fat funny story about that night? I went into the Jacks for a piss down in the Commons that night. That place now was full of fucking Republicans. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was. 
I went into the pub. Into, I don't drink. I don't take drugs. No, nothing. I went in for the piss anyway. Drying my hands. This fiend says to me, and he, and he knock. And he knock. <laughs> I says, what? And he knock, nah. And he called me by a name that's not my name. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I says, who do you think I'm not, huh? Miles, is it? I said, I'm not Miles at all, but I said, go ahead and run me. <laughs> I, I went down to my old dad, I says, anybody could have been inside the cubicle there thinking I'm selling coke at a fucking, <laughs> at a fucking <laughs> IRA show. You would have got kicked all over the bitch. You know what I mean? <laughs> Chinese whispers there, I get a bullet in the back of the head coming up the common <laughs> road. What? <laughs> Jeez, I mean, he said to me, but Paddy, Paddy spoke a lot about post-traumatic stress. Yeah. I wrote another song actually <laughs> called, uh, it's a very, I only played it once or twice now, because I don't want to be playing it all the time, Where Were You When You Were 21? Um, John Splane, yeah, like, it's been yeah. very good to me as well. And uh, Prendeville and, and Joe Duffy have been very, very good to me. Like, yeah, I've heard John Prendeville a, a few times. Yeah, very good. And John Spillane, uh, I, I, I ring him the other time for a couple of support slots and all, and he's, he said, uh, he'd be slagging me, like, one day there's no miles by, you'll get there, you'll get there always, he'd be saying. One day there's no, you'll have a song like mine, you know, slagging. But uh, <laughs> when he heard where when you, when you were 21, he said to me, there you have it, boy, he says. Fair play to you. That's it. That's it, he says. And you keep now writing songs like Where Were You When You Were 21, he said. And you'll, you'll definitely progress, Miles. And he was yeah. serious. The ball hop was gone now. He said yeah. it to me. He actually said it to me twice, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's the, the writing again, you know, with Liam Miller, Roy Keane, Teddy Mack, um, yeah. Big Joe. Like, I mean, I write in songs, right, that no one will write, basically. Mm. Can I ask you about Big Joe Joyce? Yeah. Because that one, I didn't see that one coming at all, like, no do you know what I mean? Sure. Tell us about the process, how that came about. Um, so, uh, <laughs> a fella called uh, Doxy Carroll, Donny, Donny Carroll, Donny was the founder of Finnegan's Wake, the band. Finnegan's Great Wake. band, uh, that was probably one of the favourite yeah. bands, yeah. Uh, Donny um, moved to America years ago, oh, I don't know, 30 years ago. Uh, I... I I, I made him a few times now and whatever, but we were talking songs on the internet one night and um, he sent me a lot of information about a beer knuckle boxer back in the 1800s. Supposedly this fella uh, founded beer knuckle boxing. From, he was from Waterford, Sullivan, I think. Uh, he emailed me all the stuff anyway, Doxy did, and I was on through it anyway. And I said, this stuff is never ending. Like, do you know what? Like, there was so much reading in it that like I couldn't even pin a topic or a line in it to extract far at the beginning of a song yeah. and uh, that was that was grand I thought the more of it and then uh, I, I, I bumped into this fellow called Paddy Riley but he, his nickname is Paddy Guiney but he's a Riley and he's from Waterford and uh, I, I don't know it was up in the Holly you know, or somewhere like that mm. he would have he would have been a John Burke's uh, niece's yeah. husband right so the old man said there yeah, how was the songwriting going? We were chatting away anyway. Well, so there's already had to write a song called The Friends of Mine about the travellers, you see, and they knew, they knew about the song. And So I said, there was a fella there, I said, on to me, I said, Paddy, about beer knuckle box. And he said, do you have a box yourself? I did, he said, did a couple down through the years. And so I said, you know, I don't know where to go with this beer knuckle box. And I said, he's had to put it into my brain now, mm. and I, I want to fulfil it. And he turned around to me and he says, do you know who you need to meet now? He said, is George Ice. And I said, do you know him? I do, yeah. He said, give me one minute. <laughs> so he rang Davy there and then. He says, Davy, he said, Paddy Riley here. He said, I'm down in Cork. He said, with, with, with this fella, he says, he's a serious songwriter. No, he said, it's not, he's not joking. Yeah. And Davy said, uh, should I tell him up tomorrow? Like, and I was saying, sure, I can't come tomorrow, no. So Davy told him, give, him, give me his number. I rang Davy. And actually, in between Kira, you know, Grace's niece, Kira, yeah. had died. Uh, when the yeah. meeting was arranged, and uh, probably good to And so I, I, I rang the lads, I explained what happened. So about a month afterwards, then we, we went up to, to up to the Joyce's in Moor. Uh, I met Davy um, in, in a in a car park or whatever, and he brought me out to Joe. And I remember I, I, I actually said this to Davy, and I said it to Joe's face, like I said, lads, like you know, I was warned not to come here, like. Mm. And they were like, I don't mind that. And I suppose you heard all the stories that my dad will kill you and he'd hate you and all this kind of stuff. And I said, that's exactly what I was told. They were like, no, 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 no. And they were, they were fine. Jeez, the lovely people in the house was gleaming. And the grub we were getting, the grub was unreal. Um, so I 
again, uh, it was, like there was nobody ever going to write a song about him, mm. and nobody probably would ever have the bottle anyway to sit down with him, because like, all yeah. these rumors. But I know the man personally, and the rumors are false. Yeah. But um, I hung around with Jordan for for a while. Gas character, like uh, he seems uh, like a gas character. He was brilliant. I think the what age is he? Uh, when I met him, he was sixty four. So I would say you he's know, about sixty eight now. You know when you see him in the videos, right? And he's a mad bastard, no? Like he's a nice fella and all that, but he's mad. Doesn't get away from that. Imagine him when he was in his twenties and thirties. Yeah. yeah, very religious fella, like. Yeah. He says the travellers t- t- tend to be religious, like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, he gave me a spin on the horse and the paddy lurch, and uh, as I say, we struck up a great friendship after. I still had regular contact with with, yeah. with all of them, like you know. I'd Joe said- Ward is his grandson then. The boxer. Yeah, he won actually last week. Yeah, and uh, well, I was in contact with him as well, like, you know, but uh, Gas character, I'm glad yeah. i done it. I've absolutely no regrets because it's probably one of my most famous songs, you know, mm. about the petrol. And yeah. he taught me the story about the petrol. I'd say he's some bang up there, don't it? Uh, he was brilliant, sure. Like, and do you know what the thing about it is? The video is very hard to get now because the video is made off a phone. Yeah. It was only a ball hop. Little did we know, like, that like Tyson Fury was going share on this to 1.1 million views. Mm. I screenshotted all the views before the videos were removed. Is the what, video removed now? It is because what was happening is there were so many fellas latched on that wanted a part of this. Uh, documentaries, money been thrown, we do a documentary and this and that. And I, I already had a professional videographer lined up anyway and the plan was to go back after Christmas and do it. But so the horse is bolted. Like, by the time we got into Port Leash, Paul said to me, look at that. Paul Davis and uh, he does a lot of work for, for me regarding bookings and yeah. uh, tech and uh, it was 60,000 people like on YouTube alone in, in 40 minutes like um, the song just went everywhere but and the song is available to see on YouTube isn't it it's still there what yeah. happened then was is I had to copyright all my stuff you know what's the name of it Big George Eyes Big George Eyes uh, I, I had to copyright my music and my stuff um, yeah but some clever fella I did was he actually stood and recorded it off his device. Yeah. So it wasn't shared from my platform. Therefore, the copyright won't kick in because it wasn't taken from me personally. Fuck so, it. like, if you went down now and took something belonged yeah. to me, anything, I'd get a notification from YouTube saying your content and we are now have yeah. advised him to remove it. And if he doesn't, we'll have a gun in three days. Yeah. You know, I got an email from the Eagles um, record company to remove a video of me in the PAV playing Hotel California. Oh, yeah. I remember I put up a video there ages ago, I know, on my personal YouTube channel, my dogs, it was yeah. a, a Bob Marley track in the back. Yeah. And it was just, um, they allowed me to use the video once I didn't monetize it. Yeah. They, like, I could use the track yeah. once I gave them credit and I wasn't making money from it, yeah. which was fair enough, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's weird though that, like, it's your content, but it was still allowed to step there. Like, that was, that's a, a fucked up loophole, isn't it? Yeah, it, did. it was removed anyway. The Pav, like, like, on the Pav, I remember your aunt actually been there. She was up on the top, th- clear. She was up, and the reason I could see her was because the light on the way out to the smoking area was on her, like. But I actually sold out the Pav, right? Yeah. In 12 months. I was basically getting bookings and then I was in the pav. Uh, what happened was there was a small little venue in Cork with about 40 people and it was been discriminated against, well, 100% like, because uh, it was the north side and maybe you know, such a fella, these fellas might show up here and it was mm. all yeah. at, at the beginning. But I remember the drive, right, that's still within me today and why I keep doing this. is because I called up to a fella one day and they said to me, uh, you know, could I could I go on there before you all get there and I have three songs they said and he went <coughs> you who the fuck why are you taking to see you he said he was on the phone how degrading it was Fucking right hell. he says who the fuck an agent why is Gaffney he says he's up here on a mic Gaffney he says looking for me with your fuck off boy will ya Laughing, right? No, did you ever see the mean machine, the goalkeeper, and he sees all mad things happening? I was sitting in a chair like that, like visions of myself busting the guitar off his head, mm. and he laughing into my face, and then it was like, no, I don't. And um, Fucking hell. it was very degrading. Disrespectful, right? like, and it? like that to this day, like every time I pick up a boy or to write a song, so just fell him the song of his name. Mm. But like, 
I think of him and I say, here's another one out for you, bud. Yeah. I hope you hear this one. Do you know? But like, selling out the pav was 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 the makings me and Roy Keane back in me first release mm. because you were such a superstar backing you, uh, giving you his permission to release this tune. And did you ever I, get to meet him? I did. How is he? I tell you, no, no, Bobby Donovan, no handsome Bob. I do, yeah. Well, I know him from Cove, no yeah. Mm. Yeah. Handsome was uh, running uh, a gig out in uh, Silver Springs for Cove, and Roy was uh, Roy was the guest speaker. I mean, uh, Q and A. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I never forget. I was up in Balancholic. Uh, I was up in Chili Paddy, getting a bit of grub, and uh, he came out on the radio. I said, "This is it. This is the opportunity. No ways. Don't leave it slip." So I rang Bob. I said, "Bobby, what's the crack with Roy Keane?" He says, "Yeah." He said, "Me no more." I said, "You know what? No, Bobby." I said. I have the first disc of the take of his song, the first one ever, I said, and I'd love to give it to him. I put it into a frame, I said, for him. Bobby says, leave it with me. I'll have to go out to the committee about it. Bobby rang me back about two hours later. That's sorted, he said. What we're going to do is, he said, there'll be a break. And then John McHale, he said, will be the MC. And he'll, he'll call you then. you make your way up to the stage, then he said, in front of the people, and present it to him on the stage. I, I was happy now to meet and read him out in the car. I said, yeah. all right, thanks, bye. Yeah. So I went up <laughs> to the stage anyway, right? Wild Gaffney and whatever. Next thing, anyway, he was sitting down. He was sitting next to Seamus McDonough. And next thing, he looked over, and he seen me at the side of the stage, and he got up. And he walked to me. He started walking towards me. And uh, I put up my hand, and I had the frame in the other hand and I just said to him uh, I said Roy I waited a long time I said to tell you thanks for the turn you done for me I said when I was a very very sad upset little boy I said and uh, I said now was the time to return the favour and that's why I wrote you the song and he was it was a bit of chit chat you know how you get on with yeah. and next thing I said to him before I left I says anyway Roy what do you think of the song he said uh, it's pretty good yeah I said well we will set for pretty good, I said, because if you said it's pretty good, I said it must be unreal hard know, yeah. And someone caught the two of us laughing in a picture. It's one of my favourite pictures, actually. The hands out. But um, I got to meet him, yeah, and I got to say thanks. Yeah. Uh, when we get him on the podcast, when did this? I said, I said, I said he, he seems to be very mellow these days, isn't he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's an all right, yeah. like. Of course, he's brought his own all yeah. his life. So, yeah. so did he he's good. He's good at the, the commentating. You're going to get true words out of him every time he talks. Like, yeah. Don't you? I remember I put a thing up on one of my social network and sites one time. Jesus, why will you stop making career changes? Because my song is going to be like an opera of yeah. Because I have to keep changing it, you know? Yeah. You know? I, I'm actually at the moment I'm trying to figure in how am I going to get Sky or Sky Pundit? How, how can I slip it in somewhere in the last verse? Just yeah. to... But yeah, I mean, as I wrote two songs this week, you know, I wrote a song one day, I wrote a song ye- yesterday. I went to the studio yesterday, it was a disaster. I had, no, I had a medley, I was playing a medley on a whistle, and you know, in the end, we, we, we threw our hats at it. I, I said, look, I'll go home and I'll structure a guitar all together rather than a flute. But um, I'm writing the way I'm mad at Christmas Day. I, I, I actually, for the first time ever, I, I gifted people songs. I wrote people songs as a gift, they didn't even know about it. I watched, I, I, I seen you singing one song, um, I hope they don't mind me now for saying, for Colin and oh yeah. Sonny, oh yeah. his partner, yeah. they lost a child um, yeah. and it was, it was beautiful, the song was beautiful and, and I know it meant an awful lot to that couple, you know, it, it, uh, well, to it be was... shown how, how, how many people in the north side of the city and people that know them really care for them and their hearts are going out to them, you know, because I know they're going through a, a difficult time at the moment, you know, but that was that was phenomenal what you've done there for those yeah. two people, you know, so. As, as I was saying, Teal, as, as well, like, like helping people is, is, is what, like, if my name can help someone, I, I don't want any uh, a tap in the back, no miles away. I don't want that at all. And but what I was saying to you earlier, people putting up, I gave a homeless fella a fiver there will go on Patrick's Bridge. Or, mm. Do you know all this? What, what, do you know why, why are you broadcasting it? I, I help someone every day in my life. And the reason I I do that is because of my faith, right? And I believe, right? Like, I, I have to see my mother again. Like, there's, there's, like, every day when I wake up, like, it's one day closer. Like, this meeting has to happen, like. Mm. And I believe... Through my faith in God, right? I believe in heaven and hell. 
And I believe that my good actions, while I'm here on this, this earth, in helping others that are in need, right? That please God, that when it's my turn, and if these gates are here, and this man is here that judges you, then he'll say, do you know what? You're actually all right, you. Mm-hmm. you. You've done your man a turn there, and you never look for it and back off him. Yeah. And that's why I do what I do. All I do is sing a couple of songs around the place and write a few songs or whatever. But, you know, a young fella wrote in his Christmas letter this year that he wanted to meet me for Christmas. That's do you know what I mean? Guess, and I went up to his house Christmas Eve up Montanati. The young fella was ecstatic, eight years of age. Like, that that means so much to mm-hmm. me. Like, his dad now showed me, like, what do you want for? I'd love to meet Miles Gaffney. And he's singing the songs. And, do you know? Yeah, that's brilliant, and isn't it? It's like going back to Colin that time and Karen and, and Sonny, like nobody was going to go and, and collect Sonny anyway because nobody wanted to bring a deceased baby in a car like and drive from Dublin. So like I remember when the job was tasked to me, I remember I said, yeah, no problem. And I'd be big glass mirrors in the bedroom. I remember looking and saying, Miles, tomorrow you're going to Dublin and what's going to happen is you're going to experience something that's going to stick with you for the rest of your yeah. life. And there's no looking back now. You're after committing. You're going. And that's it. And I done it. And the reason I was able to write that song so quick and give it to them is because I was there. Mm. I witnessed it. I felt it. Mm. And when I was singing it, I closed my eyes and singing the lyric, I I was reliving it. Mm. So that's why those songs, like when I sing a song, I close my eyes. I can see what I'm singing in my head. I yeah. can visualise it. Even singing about, say, Teddy Mac now, like, like I can see in my mind t- a young Teddy Mac running out for Crow Park, like, yeah. with an all Ireland medal in his hand. And that's that's my way of getting it across to the audience to connect. Because I put my heart and my mind into putting the song across for people t- to connect with me, you know? Do you want to give us a song now? Well, of course. So, <clears throat> what's the name of the song? Which one do you want to do? Just we do one or are we off for a session or what? We, we, do, we do one out of one, yeah. We do a couple, do <laughs> we? Um, do you know what, lads? I'm going to do this song right first, right? Because um, I was very pissed off there last week. Uh, I was asked to um, to forward four songs or five to a charity um, gig that was been aired all across St. Patrick's Day. And... I wrote this song called The Song for the Fallen Mother and I received two Grammy nominations uh, back in 2017 and I won the Irish Folk Album of the Year the same year and I wrote this song back then it was nominated it's the story of a woman called Joan McDermott she taught me her story I went to her house one night about the mother and baby home and what mm. she endured there and what happened to her son and and uh, so I I Pick five songs. And I really went over to me. We actually, with flags and everything, behind me for Paddy's Day. And uh, didn't I get a phone call off the chap that was editing this online gig? I know this fella very well. And uh, he was up in a heap. Why well, I'm sorry, you know, why they're after taking the song out. I said, what are you on about? He said, the song for the father mother, which I had dedicated to his mother, mm-hmm. because she loves it. Uh, some fella... Involved anyway, didn't want to piss off the clergy, mind you. The clergy. Mm. No, it would have been the clergy's best interest maybe to go on before I sang it and make an apology. Yeah. But I couldn't believe that there's still that there's people in Ireland still in their grip. Mm. And he wouldn't include this song because he didn't want to offend the parish priest. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And your man had no other choice. Like the, I, I said, it's not true at all, but I'm not just saying sorry no. for you, know? So this is a song, the song for the fall of mother. And um, I was actually up in uh, Dublin a few weeks ago. Uh, it was funny. Me and Johnny were going through uh, in Chicago. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I said to Johnny, that's where Mickey Leonard is from, the other. Yeah. And that was grand anyway. Do you from up here, Johnny was saying? We went over to this recording studio. No, I had it. I passed them the girl to, to travel. I went in the door anyway, and this one says to me, uh, How are you? You're from Cork, yeah? Do you know James Leonard? Mm. <laughs> I said, We were just talking about his dad. He said, I'm <laughs> the caller. 
Ray to the Cure. Ray to the Cure, yeah. yeah. But you know, for that, you know, that show, they used the piece of our podcast for that as well. The our interview yeah. with Catherine or Coffee O'Brien. Yeah, she's brilliant. Because the, the person that was, um, was that with, the, what was the, the Abbey, was it? Uh, the Abbey was the one in Kildare. There was a, anyway, for that, for that production it's thing. It's the Miacho. Yeah, I think that's what it was. But was that, was that broadcast on Paddy's Day? I'm not sure. Anyway, there was something broadcast about the mother and baby home, but I think it was all the same project, but they wanted to use um, an excerpt from our podcast for herself with Catherine. Oh, no. but sorry, go on, Anya. Right, so that's, this is the song for the fallen mother. The moment they slammed the door upon my admission, my dignity and identity, they stole my only possessions. In their eyes burned Satan's flame. You're the shame you've yourself to blame, and mother's superior deemed from a frame. As they christened me my fictitious name Welcome to your hell on earth For the fallen mothers of the church We well, you're nothing, you're only dirt And we'll sell your baby when you give birth So I beg Jesus and Mary would you let me keep my baby? Can I have him back if I keep going to Mass? Isn't this what you told me? As I scrub down on my hands and knees and you strip my flesh with your rosary beads with a blind eye of the powers to be What a price to pay for a pregnancy Infants screaming in distress Snatched straight from their mother's breasts The masquerading brides of Christ On their newborn wrists they slap the price Some little angels they weren't saved And their mothers were kept as slaves And nobody knows their names they're buried in shallow graves Suffer in silence, not even whisper Never forget your demonic sisters Always remember you're the sinner As you cut the grass with your paper scissors So I beg Jesus and Mary would you let me keep my baby? Can I have him back if I keep going to Mass? Isn't this what you told me? As I scrub down on my hands and knees And you strip my flesh with your rosary beads To the blind eye of the powers to be What a price to pay for a pregnancy From the walls, babies cries they haunt halls. They haunt the boss, all the boss. Very good. That's very powerful, boy. 
yeah. You have a very powerful voice and you only notice yeah. it when you're right next to you like that. Fucking and do you hell. know something old lads? I've been carrying an injury there after a gig one night, right? I got this pain, right? I'm not joking, you know. It's the worst pain I ever had in my life. I'm after spending nearly nine thousand euro trying to solve it. Um I come in from a gig and I just burn my face, my ear, my teeth, my jaw. Couldn't figure it out. MRI scans. You name it, mm. jaw surgeons. This fella one time up in the bands gave me a tablet called Tegretal. I'm telling you now, I was... That's for epilepsy. Out. I was in an awful condition, asleep yeah. and everything, couldn't drive, threw me away. You wouldn't believe this. You know, I'm a postman. Mm. Yeah. I was on Pops Key, walking along. The week after we done the Make Some Noise gig, the Shine a Light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, John Cowell, he's, he, he is a businessman on Pops Key, and he says to me, Miles, I enjoyed the... The gig by last Friday night, he says, I never knew that you wrote them songs about Cork, you know, because I kept to that kind of thing because it was our local crowd. And there was a woman with him. She just shoved me against the wall like that, James, to me. Boom. She said, see your shoulder, that one. I said, yeah. She said, it's all over the place. And she said, you know the way it's hanging down like that, she said. It's dragging your face over. Bet you have an awful pain there. What? I said, come here. I said, I may have to been to every surgeon. Every specialist, I said, trying to figure this out. The only person I got relief off was Janice Dupuy with the dry needle, and right? Yeah. So I started looking to more. Next thing, she said, right, I've done that in my hand. I mean, I could feel the whole thing just going, hmm, the pain was gone. Jeez. So what I need now, when this pandemic is over, How did I you... just need somebody to realign. She said, it's actually coming from here. The bottom may be back. Realign your spine, she said. How did I she know? That How, she was, uh, I think she was a nurse back in her day. And oh. uh, just from looking at me, that's what she done to me now. Don't pull up ski. Boom. Push me up against the wall. Push that back. She said, how do you feel? I was like, Jesus, that's great. She said, because your shoulders are out of place. So what must have happened that night? I was giving a welly and the guitar. Mm-hmm. What must have happened was I went like that. Yeah. Pulled whatever here. And kept playing every night. Mm-hmm. And never gave a time to rest where it became... A permanent problem. Yeah. But like, I, I was looking this thing up about jaw pain. They were telling me that, um, it was telling me it was, it was called the suicide disease. That, 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 the, that the pain was so unbearable. And I was reading this stuff on Google. Says, I was saying, I was saying, I was saying to myself, Jesus Christ. Reason number 248, well, you never Google yeah. the condition. Yeah, because you get some fucking diagnosis. Yeah. I don't believe that, no. And I, <laughs> I, I, I could hit higher notes before, but this thing yeah. is hindering me, so I, I hope to go back higher now. Yeah. Um, once I get it sorted, but that's, that's what happened to me. I used to be You've a whole after of, a gig uh, with ice on my ear, lying down yeah. like that with a packet of ice on my ear. You've heard of tennis elbow, now we have single shoulder. Ah, single shoulder. <laughs> I have tennis elbow too. Want to give us another man? I will, lads. Do you know what? Um, as you saw it there, the yeah. two narries there. Um, two handsome bastards, boy. So I, 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 I wrote this song when my wife was on, when I was on her hen because I wrote it because I was sick to death of, uh, of, of myself being discriminated. I was called a Northside Knacker a few times. I was actually called a Northside Knacker by a foreman of a very, very big company in Cork. Um, and... It was it was diffused by another foreman at the time, and I, I, I not that type. I left the go, but didn't I see him one night out on the dog track? The Millers, the Millers were back from America. Mm. Stephen and Kenneth, loads of us now. I tell you, it was thirty thirty bodies from from Nottinghamy in the north side went to the dog track, and there he was. And I said, there he is. I didn't see him for years. So he went into the jacks. I went in. And I said, "Hi, kid," and he went, "Do we know each other?" Proper silver spoon man, no reckon. I said, do you not remember me? I said, I'm the Northside Knacker. And he went, what? I said, remember, remember you caught me in Northside Knacker? I said, outside the Parnell pub when we were out and uh, the drinks night out. I said, do you know what you do, bud? Wash your hands there, I said. There's, there's about 30 more Northside Knackers over. I said, get your old Alice. I said, get your drink, come over, we buy you one. <laughs> i tell you, I looked over where he was standing, he wasn't there at the wall. <laughs> well, Quicker uh, than the dog going out the door. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I wrote this song as... Uh, for people putting the north side on and, and that, that was that was my logic behind it. I was sick of it myself. Found it very hard to get gigs and stuff at the start when I, when I was starting out music because where I came from. But the fellow one time saying to me, uh, no, what you should do now? If I, you know, I get rid of all them Ralph Lauren clothes you'd be wearing. That's my thing. That's my hobby. I buy Ralph Lauren clothes. That's mm-hmm. all I wear. And he said to me, uh, he says, uh, but don't often get a pair of boots or peak cap or waistcoat or checkered shirt. He says, your career will go way forward very fast. 
Like, and I was looking at him saying, like, what's this supposed to mean? Like, no, yeah. like the one about the way I was dressing. And I, I did stand out like a sore thumb. Lose your identity, like. I remember Crowley's opened their uh, music shop up in the Alba Plunk one night, upstairs in the Alba Plunk, and I went to the ground to open up. It was in like a leper to me. Stay away from me, man. The only person actually to come over and talk to me that night, probably the most high profile singer in there on the night was John Splane. He came over miles away. I didn't know him that well at the time, but he came over talking to me. He just wanted the ground to open up. Mm-hmm. Stay away from me, man. All these little clicks. Yeah. Like, I, I, I ditched it after that, didn't bother going to anything. We can like all that. relate to that in some yeah. way. I suppose everybody that's watching, there's a lot of people that are watching as well, can relate to being in situations where they've just been left out. It's, it's, you know, it's like, it's like the young fella that's. Um, left over after the two teams are after being picked yeah. and he's standing there on his own and the two teams it's the same that feeling that is yeah. Neil and the head yeah, yeah. you know and I remember what fellas talking about each other yeah. and a few weeks later then I see them all playing together I was saying like in, in the world where I where I grew up and where I come from you get badly hurt mm-hmm. for carrying on like that mm-hmm. for backstabbing and talking about a fella mm-hmm. and, I, mm-hmm. and I said no that's why you never see me in, in the city in their own the clicks all right and mm. I just I said no this is this, this nothing it's always yeah. good to hold on to your identity in the yeah. face of pressure when I hear people talking like that I always think of Lynn Rowan because she's in uh, the Shannon in Shannon Airden a politician um, with her Air Max and her yeah. fucking dress or her yeah. tattoos but there was something fucking funny there recently she was in the Shannon right and uh, Cahorluk the chair was dressing her and she says uh, one minute uh, Cahorluk I can't get my mask off over me hoops is she be a hoop yeah right? <laughs> you know what I mean but, but like fuck a fair play to her she's yeah, one man for identity but do you know do you know what the likes of her and the likes of you and people that have uh, uh, what, what did you say identities large yeah. identities like it's like he that others will follow and say, you know what, this is who I am. Just be proud this of it. Is, yeah, just keep going. Like, yeah. And I love, do you know, if I'm out um, in town or whatever um, and the kids are with me and, and I see somebody that's really unique, dressed uniquely, yeah. or looks so different, I, I think it's great because you're looking at a bit of art, something yeah. completely uh, different, different to the norm. Yeah. And I think that's, that's how it that's yeah. that's more attractive to me than and that was my philosophy to, to me starting out like like I was looking at all these fellas writing the same old songs or the same old thing mm. and, you know, and I was like nah stick to me I didn't you know represent yourself my your working class I loved the working class I'm so proud to be from the working class yeah. the area yeah. of Cork City I just love it and I was like no I don't and I think it's been said to me actually that differentiates you miles from everybody else because you're different and you, you'll do things that nobody else will do. Mm. Do you know? I walk, I, I go in out to Cypress Avenue and there'll be three or four hundred people in there to see me and I go in there like that. And mm. I pick up my guitar and I walk out onto the stage and sing away for two hours and it's brilliant. And the best thing of it all is for me is when you look, open up your eyes and look down at a crowd of people singing a song that you wrote. Mm. It's the best feeling for me ever. Do you I know? I mean, see that north side till we die. Like, yeah. I sang that one day. Me, if he'll play that for me up in Crow Park, right, when they won the All Ireland, right, in a very historical ground in Ireland, yeah. on a national stadium, and they played me there, and, and, and I was so happy. Yeah. And they asked me to come up to Mayfield and sing it, right? <laughs> and I'm telling you now, there was about 400 people singing it. I sang it for about 15 minutes straight. Kept going, going, because yeah. they kept going, I kept going. And I, I just had to stop in the end. But there's no better feeling in the world. Like Mayfield is a massive part of the North Side. Yeah, yeah. huge. They're all Very massive parts of the North Side. It's my stronghold, actually, believe it or not, because yeah. we can tell from ticket sales where yeah. people are. And, like, a quarter of tickets for a gig in Cork are sold in the general Mayfield area. Mayfield is probably the biggest geographical location of the north side. It's probably the biggest area in the north side, wouldn't it be? Mm-hmm. Most populated, isn't it? Yeah, Mayfield. It would be, yeah. Mayfield, so. yeah. Mayfield yeah. is vast, Dick. Like. Yeah, it is. So if it we is. go from, so look, we're getting very technical here now for the people that are not from Cork, but if you can go from Tivoli over as far as Ballandary Park and everything in between yeah, Silver Heights. Yeah, say and from the swimming pool down as far as Lord and Moor, yeah. the big... And back down, I went up as far as what's that Ashmont and all yeah. that area. It's huge. Just big area. spot, like. Yeah. But, uh, do you want to give us another song before I we will. close? So. I will, so let's. North Side Till I Die. So I'm talking North Side Till I Die. And as they say, I always dedicate this song to somebody. The last time I played Cypress Avenue, I dedicated it to poor old Frankie Dunn. Mm, um, and Frankie. I, uh, I used to go into the Simon and sing a few songs when, when, when we could. And 
One day I went in there and one of the lads working in the kitchen said to me, uh, there's a guy in here, he said, and he's saying a lot of nice things about you and you see a great time fan. He had said that I uh, was very helpful for, for to the people and that I um that 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 I was stuff for my people and I represented the north side and I was very uh, very moved by it. I mm. thought it was a lovely thing to say about me and I was very happy that somebody thought of me like that. And I asked him who it was and he said it was uh, Leon Kavanagh. And poor old Leon was buried today, actually. He was, yeah. Um, and I'm very grateful to say that Leon Kavanagh spoke so highly of me. Mm. And I think it's the least I could do this evening but dedicate the North Side till we die to, to, to Leon Kavanagh and his family. Yeah. Till I die, in our sight till I die. I sure I am, I know I am. Our sight till I die. I hold in our sight till I die. In our sight till I die. I sure I am, I know I am. Our sight till I die. Oh, we have Knocker and Churchfield and old Blackpool And up in the North Mon where I went to school I grew up on the North Side doing no harm I was born and raised on Redemption Road I used to be a farm Oh, I'm North Side till I die The North Side till I die Sure I am, I know I am North Side till I die I I'd listen to the stories me nan she would tell Stories about Blarney Street and the jail on Sunday as well And the stories about the North Chapel and the Shannon Bell she tell About Nashes and the Coal Cay and on Spangle Hill as well She was North Side till she died, the North Side till she died Sure she was, I know she was, North Side till she died When I sing the voice of Fair Hill, it gives me such a thrill. Stories about the ladies and the boys up Dublin Hill. The Glen Farm, we in Mayfield, and Grana Brahar too. They all make up the north side, it belongs to me and you. Oh, we're north side till we die, we're north side till we die. Sure we are, we know we are north side till we The people from the north side, they watch each other's backs. And if you call to a door, you'll be greeted with tea and snacks. To be called an Ari, it fills my heart with pride. And no matter where I roam, my home is the north side. Oh, I'm north side till I die. The north side till I die. Sure I am, I know I am north side till I die. If there's a north side up in heaven I know I'll be the king And when I walk in the gates Up the north side I will sing And all the folks they'll stand there That I've waited to see They'll be Christine Long and Vinnie O'Brien And Adrian Keating And they will north side till they die They will north side till they die Sure they are, I know they are North side till they die well, Lads, this is your boss You! <laughs> Two of the boys from the North side They turned their life around From the depths of addiction A new path in life they found Now they offer people a platform Talk of the future, present and the past It's Timmy and James The two Norris podcast And they are not cycle They're not cycle, they die Sure they are, I know they are Not cycle, they die Oh, they're not cycle, we die They're not cycle, we die Oh, sure we are
That's brilliant. You made history tonight. I'd say <laughs> Rowan, sorry, baby. <laughs> if, you got if, you're look, if you're looking for a Danny Dancers, give Rowan a show. <laughs> <laughs> I heard he was a yes, no, uh, one two step. Uh, I'd say you don't have to get uh, the crowd going when when you sing that inside ah, in pubs. Yeah. Like. Do you know what? No, I wrote that when my wife was away on her hen, right? Yeah. And do you know what? I ended up back in a party with uh, yourself, Gummy, mm. uh, Danny Sherlock from Mallow, Alan Kelleher, and Popsy Sullivan. And I was out to get my first radio player that Friday morning and um, we went back to the party anyway and uh, the Neil Prendival rerun do you know at night it was on the radio and Keller says uh, you're on the radio there I heard it the other morning and I don't know was it Gavin or Alan said do you know what you should do Miles you should write a song about the north side bye and all that kind of stuff been discriminated against and stuff mm. from where we're from and getting a bad name all the time I said, you know what? I'll have a go off it. So we went, I went down to the top of the hill then the next day for the cure. But didn't I have the song written? They never forget it. Me sipping gummy went into a speed. I was, oh, mother of God. I tell you, like, the grub. I tell you. And we went up for the cure. I think I went for the cure. He went home, I'm sure. And um, we, we were inside the pub and there was a sing song. And I, I was out writing that that night. And uh, I started singing it. And I remember Spider, John Cronin, and they uh, plug along and they do that their hands. Yes! And they were saying, they love it. I was like, go on, kid. Last night till we die. And they were only after hearing it. And yeah. they were singing it. And then they, they'd all go quiet then. Yeah. And they'd sing the verse. And then once they got back, no, it, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was like, yes, we have something. Because it has that kind of a chant, football yeah, chant, with yeah. that anybody can just join in. And, 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 uh, and uh, since then, I was actually kind of embarrassed at the time. I was saying, there's no, they'd be all mocking me or whatever. <laughs> And I always have to say it too, like that, like, this is not a dig at anyone, this is just proud of where we come from. No, it, over time I've put one in about the South Side as well, because yeah. my grandfather, Eddie O'Neill, yeah. he was from the South Side. Yeah. Do you know what, I, I, he's in the song, if I came from the South Side, I don't know how yeah. I'd feel. Yeah. My granddad came from the South Side, his name was Eddie O'Neill. Yeah. Do you know what, and yeah. like, South Side, I have cousins out there. Yeah. But, um, but at the end of the day, it's so just been like, proud of being a cock person, so yeah. Yeah. West, w- working North, class. East. Yeah. It's just we're, we're all the same at the end of the day. It's just. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what gets to me? Like, is people looking down? I always had a problem with authority. Mm. Not a problem with authority. You're people, in the right podcast, so. <laughs> people who inf- enforce authority. Yeah. You know, some fella. Remember, I walked my fellas years ago to get a promotion. They're going to the old canteen then. To the new canteen. Mm. Don't talk to them no more then. That kind of stuff. That uh, don't with me at all. Mm. And um, I, I always had a, had, a, had a problem with authority. Uh, if some fella asked me to do something nicely, there'd be no problem. But I'd have to pull a fella up then if I thought he was yeah. mistreating me. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say myself and James would probably had problems with some stage in our lives as well. I, I, I would have always in the back of your head. He, he, uh, he, he, he's doing this to me because I'm from the north side. Like mm. that's the way I would think. Yeah. You know, I, I think we, we there's times where we could have an inferiority complex, or mm. certainly I speak for myself and you. Maybe a kind of a low self esteem about where yeah. you're from, especially when you're in an area that's or in a, in a, in a context where there's no an outsider. You know what I mean? And you might feel like I don't know. It's it's something that I've kind of got more comfortable as I got older and become more settled and I suppose confident. But when I was younger, I used to always kind of feel like. I don't know, it was that inferiority. I, I'm from the north side, and when I say where I'm from, I want to look at me differently, that type of thing, yeah, you know. But the, it, but the song is about embracing it, being proud of it, and that's what you're doing with your music. And that's, that's, and that's life. what you're doing with the podcast. That's, in li- that's life, is about embracing yourself, embracing your shit, embracing, embracing who you are, you know, and just going with it and, and learning and just... Yeah. Just becoming that person you're always supposed to be, you know, and, and but you have to overcome some difficulties as well before yeah. you can actually be that person yeah. that when you look in that mirror, you haven't got a problem with the person that's looking back. No, I'm very, that's that's I'm, the key, like. I'm very satisfied with my yeah. life today, you know. Yeah. I have a great job. My kids are healthy. We have a lovely home. We want, for, we have everything we need. Um, and... I, I, I gave up holding grudges and bitterness. There's people, there's one or two fellas around place wouldn't talk to me. That's fine. I can sit in this chair this evening knowing that that's not my fault 
And I actually slewed one fella three times. Now he still ignored me. But when I see him the next time, I'll slew him again. Mm. I, like, unfortunately, there's, there's people related to me and stuff like that. Just relationships just went estranged mm. over the years and people said things. And, yeah. But again, I Part can sit here content in mm. myself like that. Like, I did nothing wrong to these people. Mm. Anybody I ever did wrong to, I apologised mm. and put my hand up. And for the last few years, I'd be saying to Grace, they're home. You f- you f- really, like, are you actually getting that excited over a rat cover? Yeah. Are you actually getting... Can't, like, it's to, it's, <laughs> a re- cover, it's yeah. relevant to me, right? Yeah. This stuff, is this material, material stuff, it's relevant in life. Yeah. It's not, as you said in one of your podcasts, it's nice to have things. Mm-hmm. But like this whole keeping up and... Yeah. I was one of them. I wanted my first house, 21 years of age. Big mortgage, big four-bedroom house. Honda Civic, spoilers, the whole lot, flashy boy, up in the pub, what are you having? You having to get that there? Mm. One in the morning, you're going to this price of a slice yeah. of ham? Mm. I can jack the lad around the road, yeah. and like, and I, I live that, like, I don't want that anymore. I'm happy you now with me couple of, uh, me uh, red Florin hats and, and a couple of t-shirts and a coat yeah. and a pair of Max. And that's me happy and a bit of paper and a boy wrote and, yeah. and I write in a few songs. It's a great place to be. Takes wisdom and maturity. And but... Jim, sorry, this COVID-19, I gave none of my energy, right? I didn't comment on Facebook or anything because I felt as if I write a song about it and I said, look at me, fuck. I just say mental, the pressure. Uh, but what it taught me is was life in the fast lane. I live my life in the fast lane all, all my life. No time for, for mm. just ju- ju- I'd be going everywhere. Like I come in from work now still I go straight to the tumble dryer. So in that there I'll fall in. Mm. Uh, so I said to be done upstairs race I go up and I'll do it. Do mm. you know I'm always in the go. I don't watch telly or anything like that. Yeah. But what it taught me right is the children. For the first five or six weeks into say this time last year right mm. I was still caught in that rut Home off from work and uh, five o'clock now in live and the internet and so in the kitchen and the kids in the front room now they can't come out now lock them mm. in there for two hours do you know but then after a while I was up to tell us and I'd play and all the speakers up to tell us playing for all the neighbours and everything yeah. but after a while coming in from work and the kids were like hey dad and I was like hi I'm hugging hey, can you play with us today dad of course I can yeah and it, the penny dropped like on a Sunday like I'd be in bed late. And the reason I went back to work was because I could see these habits starting to kick in with me, especially so I don't drink. I was never a big drinker as such, like one night a week would do me. Like I started having two, three, four bottles, five, six, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday, Monday, mm. seeing a pattern starting to form, mm. revolving around music and that whole environment. So that's why I decided to go back to work. I was making a handy living out of playing music full time. Now I only do gigs that kind of matter or important, you know. But going back to it, the kids like, and I was saying to myself, on a Sunday, they all been rushed home. I ain't getting out of bed at one o'clock, seedy, after been out travelling all night, into town for the dinner. We were down every Sunday for our dinner. It was kind of a treat, kind of a family thing because I was missing all week. And then, come on, oh, come on, dad, daddy has to be here. Uh, Daddy has to be somewhere up for six o'clock or seven o'clock, all into the car, big hollow blue. Do you know? And what I noticed is like my family time with my children now is brilliant. All of them. Do you know? I never like my uncle and you know, all playing games, playing action heroes, playing Nerf guns, do you know, cuddling them, watching the telly, uh, simple things, movie nights, Friday night, popcorn and a couple of glasses of coke and I ne- I I was missing all that because I was so caught up in I suppose I should have better myself and get progress yeah. in the music but there's other ways to progress in music yeah. I have a manager who'll meet me in the morning mm. please God and we'll get something going in the UK but, but like where I was running to basically meant nothing at the end of I the day I know but Covid yeah. slowed us all down and it made us value and realise what was actually important and it was yeah. just the connections and the family and all that yeah. but we're going to have to leave it there because we're going yeah. to run no juice yeah. on the battery cool, but man. you represented yourself really well and your area your yeah. family you have a great voice. Thanks so much Thanks, for this. Thanks, I really yeah, appreciate you, know. you having And me we're on. proud of you. We're very proud of you. Too, we're proud of you. And you know something? Do you know, actually, before we go on, CDs, one day I said, Timmy Long, down to Timmy Long's house in Churchfield. Timmy was out on the drive. I said, Timmy, why in the name of God, what are you buying? But I had been there the day before as well, and Nicole wasn't there, and I brought, I brought down to Brownie's house. Mm-hmm. And he says, me and James Leonard, he says, I swear to God, <laughs> 
I start up a podcast. So I was the postman who delivered this. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> way. <laughs> well, you'll do. Actually, that one was damaged. <laughs> Oh, Jesus uh, Christ, that's uh, true. Yeah. Look, that's a great story to finish on. Thanks again. Uh, that's, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks, 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 Ron. Thanks and we'll see you all again next week. See you later. Thank you. The year was 94. God came knocking on our front door and on me. The seven, he took my mom to heaven. <laughs>